I do lack self-confidence. Like, it's funny that you said what other people say because I'm really good at the facade of confidence. I'm a very, very driven person. Like, if somebody tells me I can't do something, by God, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it with vigor. Negating the naysayers, but then also using people who have positive things to say, like, maybe I should believe them. Today's guest is a professional athlete. Now that in itself is pretty cool. But more remarkably, and why I wanted to have her on the episode, is that she's a professional obstacle course racer and a pro Spartan. Now, if you feel like you're lacking confidence, if you've wondered why you don't push yourself harder, or if you've ever thought that you're not getting the results you want in business, in life, or in physical fitness, this episode is for you. Because what I end up learning is that you have to discover who you are through your struggles. And when you push beyond your limits, you actually just find the next level for yourself. We talk about all that and a whole lot more this week with my guest, Ashley Heller. Welcome to the We Do Hard Things podcast. Um, the more that I've learned about you, you know, before we were we jumped on this, you said, you know, you asked the question like, why do you want to talk to me? And, um, <laughs> and so um, the place I'd like to start with is, is you appear to be a very competitive person. Is that, is that, is that accurate? Um, yeah, I would say that's accurate. No <laughs> matter what I do, I have to do it better, faster or something. <laughs> I, I love that. I love that because I've never seen my, I've never been as competitive as I want to be. Honestly, like I look at, I, I, I get very competitive if I think I can win. And if I don't think I can win, I go, what's the point? No, oh, but see, that's the difference that you have to believe you're going to win no matter, no matter what. That's, that's the thing. <laughs> well, so, so I wanted to ask you, like, have you, do you, so, so here's the interesting, the question I have, have you always been competitive? And um, do you think this is something that's just innately within you? Or have you, in fact, been able to learn and develop the competitive nature over time? I think that it's something kind of innately in me, but also fostered in me as a child, you know, because as children model behaviors and both of my parents are very much like that, very driven, very determined. Um, <clears throat> and so it's, I think it's something that like I, I picked up on from them, but I'm also a lot like them. So I do think that, yeah, no matter what I, like when I was a little kid, like little, little kid, and they do their little running events, I had to beat all the boys. I had to be faster. And I, I was, but <laughs> like, <laughs> it was just a thing. And I think a lot of it too, as I've gotten older is I definitely, still want to be seen as e equal on that playing field. So I want to do everything I can to prove that I can be just as good as anybody else. <laughs> so, so is that like a boy versus girl thing you think in your, like, is, is that what I'm hearing or? or no, that's just, like a, just me everyone, better than everyone else. <laughs> everyone. <laughs> yeah. Everyone else. It doesn't, doesn't matter gender. It doesn't matter <laughs> peers, friends. Like, I mean, I can still be competitive with my friends and they still be my friends, but no, like, there's, there's no gender difference. No, no, just everyone. <laughs> like, okay, funny story. So I've been learning to play the piano this year mm. and I'm like one of the few adult students that my piano teacher has. And every time that um, I like pass off a song, so it's good enough that I can move on to the next one. She gives the little kids stickers and a star <laughs> or something, or we used to get yeah, when, some I of kid, them. when I was a kid, it was a stamp, like in the book, you got a little stamp. Ooh, yeah. Well, is there a sticker and you get to put the sticker on your song. And for a long time, she wasn't giving them to me because I was an adult and they were sitting on her piano. I was like, what are these for? And she's like, I give them those stickers when they pass off a song. I was like, oh, who has the most stickers? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to have the most stickers and I'm competing against six year olds. <laughs> oh, I love, I, so, um, so if it comes naturally to you, you can't teach me how to be more competitive, I guess, but, but what, what sparks that competitive nature within you? Because I, I, I uh, want to be more competitive. I want to be. Yeah. Well, and I think it can be taught to an extent. Like a lot of it is your mindset. Um, when you go into something like believing that you are, are, going to be the greatest at it you can possibly be. And sometimes like for me, like that doesn't always mean I'm going to win, but if I can be better than I was the last time, I think that's still a definition of competitiveness because mm. then you have something to compete against, whether like, you know, on the, the results sheet, if you're not first, but you were better than you were before, that's still victory, you know? Um, that's, that's interesting. Cause I was speaking with Sonia Wick, um, who's uh, an, an, 
Iron Man, uh, Iron Man athlete and um, was working to, to win Kona in her age group. And yeah. after five years of trying, uh, she came in second. And, and I said, that must have just been crushing for you. And she's like, no, no that was like the greatest win ever. And I was, yeah. and I was thinking, really? <laughs> like, if you're so yeah, yeah. competitive that you, that you have to be the best, not being the best must be crushing, no? No, because at the same time, like, if you aren't the best on that day, one, there's so many other variables. But also, if you, if you were, then now what do you have to shoot for? Like, because that, that's, that's the draw is continually trying to be better, no matter what. Hmm. So if you just won every time, I'm, I mean, yeah, that'd be cool, but it also is kind of boring at the same time. So like, it's, it's the journey of being, like, of getting to that point. I think that's the desire, like hmm. for me anyways. Mm-hmm. So, so before you were, uh, and I mean, I guess for our listeners who aren't familiar with Spartan, what is the Spartan? So I describe it as, I say I'm a professional obstacle course racer. And usually people are like, huh, what's that? Like Spartan? And I'm like, or they say like Tough Mudder. And I'm like, yeah, kind of. Yeah, basically. <laughs> um, so it's basically a, well, Spartan specifically, I'm on Spartan Pro Team, but it's a running event anywhere from well, I stick to 5K to half marathon distance. There are longer ones. I don't do those myself. Um, with several obstacles thrown in there, depending on the distance of the event. So, you know, barbed wire crawls, uh, rigs, so like uh, things like monkey bars, rings, um, grip strength obstacles, carrying heavy things up sides of mountains, running up mountains, very arduous, undulating terrain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And you, and, and, you run these, and and now you're running these, like you'll do one on a Saturday and then the next, and then the very next day is a separate second one or something like you're doing not one sometimes back to back. Yeah. Sometimes back to back. So ideally more on the competitive circuit though. So I'm on run elite. There's certain races that are deemed more valuable than others, like for points and for like series and prize money, et cetera. Um, so usually that's only one day, but some people who, can tolerate it or want to compete again, we'll race again the next day. I, I do that sometimes. Yes. <laughs> and, and so I'm curious. So, so you, you ran when you were little, you know, to, to beat everyone else. And then in high school <laughs> and in college, uh, you know, you're running cross country and you try out for um, the Olympics team and, you know, doesn't quite go the way you want, but you're still super, super competitive. As far as I can tell, you know, you're, you're running all the time. And then um, before Spartan started in, I guess, 2017, you had like a major injury that kind of set you back. Yeah. How do you know all this? <laughs> I, I do research on people before I take an hour of their time. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> um, yeah, that's like my life story. Um, <laughs> Sorry, no. this is about to get uncomfortable, but it's about to get <laughs> no. uncomfortable. <laughs> well, I mean, I probably put it out there on social. It was just... <laughs> um, amazing what the internet will find right Very anyway nice. um yeah so uh the goal was to qualify for the trials i didn't think i'd make an olympic team but the goal in track after college was to qualify for the trials and i didn't make it and then i got upset and i started running a lot i guess like to kind of take out my um anger frustration and i was stupid and i broke my foot so i had a stress fracture for a long time but i didn't realize it and then one day on a run it definitely just cracked like I felt it. I knew what happened. Um, I actually broke my metatarsal into four pieces. So I broke it. I had two fractures, two different directions. It was pretty terrible. Um, <clears throat> there, I almost had to have surgery to put it back together, but then it would compromise my running career. So we just let it heal. It took 12 weeks for that bone to heal. It was, that's a long time for a bone, by the way. Um, <laughs> and then after that, I was just, I was kind of lost. I'm not going to lie. Um, because I've been a competitive person, I've always done something to compete in. And I remember my college coach telling me, he was like, after this, like, if running isn't it for you for uh, forever, you're the type of person that there's just, you're, there's got to be something. Like right now, I just talked to my dad the other day. He thinks that I should race motocross. <laughs> oh, <laughs> He's been telling be me awesome. that since I was like 12. And I was like, I don't. I just, I just went dirt biking. I mean, not motocross, but I just went dirt biking with my son. <laughs> last night and I woke up really sore this morning, but I yeah. imagine most of the things you do uh, <laughs> will, will make you pretty sore. I know. I was like, Dad, I don't really know. If, eh. I mean, I can ride a dirt bike. I grew up riding them, but I just, it's funny. So there's always going to be something for me. 
Um, and then I actually just saw a Facebook ad for a local gym for the local Spartan race. And then I joined, well, I didn't really need a gym because I also am a personal trainer. I've got like 12 certifications, something that's silly. Um, and, uh, I went there just to like have access to the equipment and ended up doing the race. And then I ran the open and I won and I was like, Oh, well, this is kind of fun. Maybe we should try it again. And then it just kind of but took in, off in from those, there. In that, in that 12 week. And the reason why I brought up, you know, you injuring yourself in that 12 week period, because you, because I, I do know about it because you did post a post about it. And <laughs> a long time ago, that was, that was uh, years ago. <laughs> it was a number of years ago, but uh, you know, you spoke of like, when, honestly, when I, when, I, when I first saw your, when I first started learning your story, I was like, this woman is impressive and badass because of success and because of strength and because of, you know, <laughs> I'm going to work on my grip strength so I don't fall. And then you do. And it's just like, it's like win after win after win, great time after great time. And it's all looks so amazing and so, so like inspiring. But then I go <laughs> like, but then I go like, ah, see, there was a moment though where before you had any of this, right? Before you were doing Spartan, before you started winning, before you, you know, went to the world champions and, and joined the pro team and came in third place with USA. And like before all these wins, you had a moment <laughs> where I, I, it sounds like you doubted if you could go on, if everything you knew was getting ripped away from you, if, um, if you even knew how to proceed. Like, I don't know if it was that dramatic or not, but, but I'm curious in the Valley because that turnaround, like you wouldn't have everything that you had now if you didn't keep going back then, right? Yeah, that's true. Um, I'm not gonna lie, that, that fracture, which is funny because I have a stress fracture right now too while we're talking, um, <laughs> but from something else. <laughs> um, so that, that, was, that was really hard. It took a long time. I did think it was gonna be over, um, but I remember I just did a lot of stuff that I like to distract myself. I started doing like stupid craft things <laughs> here to like occupy my mind at home. Um, and I don't know, I guess it, I, it kind of, it pissed me off for lack of a better term. Um, and I ref, I just refused to let it beat me. Like there were some dark days for sure. Um, and I guess you could say, you know, like kind of some depression throughout that period. But then I think once I got like over the hump, then I was just angry and I was like, no, I have to prove myself, my body, everything else wrong. Like I can do this and no one is going to take it from me. <laughs> and so do you think for you, and, and maybe you're not comfortable parking here, but, but I always think this is where the learning is. Do, did the doubt come from within you or did it come from those in your life who said, you know, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? You're hurting yourself. Um, which is funny because I still, people still say that to me. People close to me still say that to me. Um, you know, you're putting your body through so much and you can only take so much. Remember you have the rest of your life to live and all this crap. And I, I think that's garbage first of all. Um, <laughs> but I think and so like that kind of made me mad too, because i am always been, I'm a very, very driven person. Like if somebody tells me I can't do something, then by God, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it with vigor because that's the only thing I know. <laughs> um, and so I think people doubting me kind of fuels my fire um, more so, but there's also people that will say the opposite too. They'll say like, you are strong. Like somebody today just messaged me and told me that I, it was amazing that I was able to keep running on a broken leg, which is recently happened because I got hit by a car. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a different conversation. <laughs> Fun fact. <laughs> um, so it's just like, yeah, that, that's validating kind of, but at the same time, I think, I really think it's the naysayers that give me the most motivation to prove them that they're wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so maybe so, it's just because I'm defiant. I don't know. <laughs> and, and so you, you have had, a, I, I did read um, in an interview that you did, that you talked about that you work with, um, you know, uh, I guess a sports psychologist or someone to help with uh, the everyday anxiety, but the, um, the, the performance anxiety. So, so just from outside, it seems like you're, you're very driven. You're very competitive, <laughs> which means you have high standards. 
Uh, yeah. you, you say that, you know, you're disciplined and you have, you have all of this education, you have all of this dedication, you've, you've committed your life to this. Um, does that not put a lot of, do you not put a lot of pressure on yourself then? Yeah, I do. I'm, and I think I've gotten a little bit better at that. I mean, you know, cause you, it's cliche, but we're all our own worst critic. Um, I would say that I'm really, I'm really good at the facade of confidence, but I do lack self-confidence and working with the sports psychologist, that's what I've gained the most out of it. Um, is just like, like, it's funny that you said what other people say, because one of the things that we've talked about working with her is negating the naysayers but then also using the people who have positive things to say, like, maybe I should believe them because what they're saying is in fact true. I am tough. Um, I am a bleeping savage. I actually write that in my journal. <laughs> um, again, it's kind of going back to that chip on my shoulder where I just have to prove people wrong. And I think this happened, if we back up like a few decades, um, which is something you probably don't know about my story. Yeah. Mic drop. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I haven't, I haven't stalked you. Although I did try to figure out from your license plate in, in the background of a Subaru photo, which state you lived in. Couldn't tell if it's Idaho. Couldn't tell if it's Montana, but it's you know, Idaho. there you go. So I did stalk you a little bit, but <laughs> social media. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway. So when I was like four, third, 14, 15, around there, beginning high school, um, I started having a lot of prob heart problems. Um, so I actually have what's called a PFO. It's a patent foramen ovale. It's an extra valve in the upper chambers of my heart that, long story short, is supposed to close within like 72 hours after birth. Mine didn't close. And so I, my heart shunts unoxygenated blood to the other side of the heart to be immediately distributed to the rest of my body without going through the lungs and stuff, right? So I have a higher risk for like stroke <laughs> um, <laughs> and stupid stuff like that, you know, whatever. Um, and when I was like, I think I was around 15 or 16, once they finally figured out what was wrong with me, um, the cardiologist told me that I, sh I probably shouldn't run anymore. I shouldn't be an athlete anymore. And I remember I was there with both my parents and my mom, started crying, of course, and was like, you should really consider what he's talking about. And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I mean, of course, at 16, you think you're invincible. Um, I still think I'm invincible, but <laughs> within reason. Uh, <laughs> anyways, and I remember looking at my dad and he was just didn't have any emotion on his face at all. And I was like, and I knew what he was thinking. And because the risk was I could have a stroke and potentially die, I guess. Um, and so I, uh, from, I remember from that day, like it was a very definitive moment in my life. <laughs> um, I decided that if that was my way to go, I was going, I would rather be compromised doing something I love than sit on the couch wishing I could do something that everybody else was doing. And so I think like from that day on, I try to make all of the choices I make in my life with everything to not have any regrets. So I want to do the cool things. I want to do cool and prove that I'm can do rad epic adventures. <laughs> that is so, I mean, that's, that's amazing. I didn't know that story. So bravo. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sure. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, listen, I'm, uh, I'm possibly uh, older than you. I, I have four kids. Um, you know, my oldest just started grade nine. She's, she's turning 14. And so the thought oh. of sitting in a doctor's office and, um, and if the doctor said that, I'd be like, <laughs> no way in hell are you- You're sitting down on the couch, Are forever. you doing this stuff, you know, but- um, yeah, yeah, but would you want her to be unhappy for the rest of her life? No. Wishing she could do things? No, not at all. And-, or, and That's worse. Yeah, but- So much worse. No, oh my goodness. Uh, anyway, but <laughs> um, so, so, so much of what you're saying, I, I have carried and, and felt myself, you know, like, like, so I have another podcast called the Something to Prove Podcast. Where, where, okay. Where, so, so like when you start to talk about like something to prove and something like, Oh my goodness. Like, like, I think, <laughs> I think that, that there's a healthy side to the need to prove and there's a, there's an unhealthy side as well. 
Um, but for me, it comes from just the feeling of not being good enough. Like, like, yeah, I, so, so earlier we talked about how I'm, I'm kind of competitive if I think I can win. And if I think I can't win, I, I just go, okay, cool. Like even, I don't like board games. My wife loves board games. She wants to play them. I am into that board game to win up until the moment where I'm like, oh, it's clear I'm not. And then, and then I don't get pissy. I just go like, oh, I'm bored now. Like there's no, I'm not in it, right? I'm not in it. So what's the point? Uh, <laughs> but, but for me, it comes from, from like a reinforcement of like, oh, see, you're not good enough. Um, you know, why did you think you could do this and succeed? <laughs> see, you just made a fool of yourself in front of everyone. And oh, so, that's not true. <laughs> well, you know, so I've never been athletic and then I've spent the last, you know, two years and I've lost weight. And then during COVID I've done a, what I consider a lot of running, you know, I was running five or 10 K every day. Um, and so now I'm, now, now I'm getting back to the gym and suddenly my cardio is amazing. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm crushing this. And so I want to do something harder. Like I want to do a tough mother or uh, when I was learning about Spartan, I was like, I could do this. And then I watched videos and I was like, <laughs> Oh, I don't so think I could do this. <laughs> you can do it. Yes, you do. So you just have to believe it. You have, to, I mean, yeah, but, sorry. So how do you, oh, but, but this is it. So you have the chip on your shoulder. You have <laughs> the competitive nature. You have the, you don't think I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. You, you say that you that you're able to put up a front of confidence. So we do hard things. I tell myself that because it's not whether I want to or not. It's whether I, not whether I think I can or not. It's just, this is a hard thing and I'm going to do it. What do you tell yourself um, you know, uh, the day before a race or the day of a race, like what do you do to get to the place where you can at least fake that confidence if you're not feeling it internally? See, well, okay. So to clarify, it used to be a facade. I think I'm getting better at it actually being genuine. So that has been a work in progress though. And I think we all struggle with that to an extent, you know, just with media and expectations and just our society is like that. Right. Um, but that is funny. I do a lot of things like leading up to a race in particular. Like I, I sit down with like the course map and I, I run the race in my head and execute every single obstacle. So like things like that, that I know that when I go into it, I'm going to be um, like, I feel confident with each obstacle, with everything that I'm going to be faced with, with every bit of terrain, et cetera. Right. So I'm mentally prepared because I've already ran the race in my mind. Um, and then I also journal for a bit and some of the big, <laughs> the big things I write is the, I'm a effing savage. Um, <laughs> and then uh, there's one thing that me and my um, sports psych have worked on too. One of the, I have this like acronym. She probably doesn't even know I turned it into an acronym, but it's. How efficient of you. <laughs> PTL equals C. So pushing the limits equals confidence. So if I'm pushing to constantly be just a little bit harder, red line just a little bit further, like just a tiny bit more, that means I believe I can do it. And then I will. Like just the belief of doing it means like, or that I can do it means that I will do it. That sounds overly simplified, but like, and it kind of takes practice, I think. But I also have learned that like my body is physically stronger than I, my mind deems it capable of, except when you get hit by a two ton car pile of steel going down a road. That's different. Um, <laughs> that was not my fault. <laughs> you were running so fast. You just darted into traffic. No, I, I was on a bike actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, <laughs> I, yeah, so it's, it's a matter of, like I pushing that limit means I can, I can maintain it. I'm capable of that. I have to believe that my body is capable of it. The only thing holding me back is my mind. So if I can shut that off or convince it that it'll keep going, then it will. Like, I don't know how else to explain that. <laughs> I've, I've, I've learned it myself um, without, but, but I struggle to carry it to other areas of my life. So, so the lessons that you've learned um, in the hardest moments of your training or, um, uh, you know, the dedication in between races, because, you know, the races are probably like all of the prep work probably matters just as much as the day of, you know, um, and then the day of, you know, sure the adrenaline's there, but I'm sure at a certain point, if you're doing a 30, you know, whatever, 36 kilometer race or something, one of the long <laughs> ones, 
that adrenaline's got to wear off eventually. Uh, and so in those moments, what do you learn is my first question. And it sounds like, you know, I'm stronger than I think I am and I can keep going and all this stuff. But then how do you carry that to the other parts of your life to help with the anxiety, the, the, the need to perform on social, the need to be the perfect person, the need to be a great partner, the need of all of those things? That's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> so I think, well, I don't know. I think there's something very primal about racing. Like, so we'll use world championships last year in Tahoe. That morning it snowed. Um, the start was delayed and <clears throat> it was probably one of the hardest races. Like if you ask anybody who raced it, that most people have ever done, there was a lot of people dropping out from hypothermia. It was cold. It was miserable. I freaking loved it. It was my probably favorite race of all time still. And it was just something about like how, like the, just the raw primal feeling of it. Like it was, it was basically survival in our modern society. And again, I was kind of thriving off of the carnage. Like I remember, I, I tried to take the energy around me and this sounds like super hippie, but I was trying, I tried to take the energy around me and use that to my advantage. So like when I feel tired or I'm doubting myself, like if there's, it sounds really dumb, but if there's like a bird flying, I'm like, wow, that bird flies for forever. Be like that bird, channel that bird's energy, which sounds so stupid, but it's not stupid. It's, it's not stupid. When I go, when I go running, my, my last, my last thing at home is like, there's a stoplight and I have to run not that far. I don't know. Let's say 400 meters. But from that stoplight, when it goes green, I try to beat the cars to my oh. house. Because, risky. Be careful, but, no, yeah. no, no. I'm on the sidewalk. Right. Okay. <laughs> I try to, I try to beat them to my house because they got to like slowly start up and there's traffic and this and that. And if I can beat some of them, I'm like, I'm faster than cars. I'm yeah. <laughs> way faster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they pass me later anyway, but still like look at how fast I am. So I could see trying to suck the energy or the joy or not the joy, but just, just take the things that are around you and go, look at how much better I am. Yeah. Yeah. So I try to use the energies around me. And then also like that could be positive or negative. So like in that race, I remember distinctly after people were dropping out after <laughs> not even before the swim, it was cold. It was so cold and windy. It was, it was awful. I mean, it was awful, but it was great. I loved it. Anyway, um, there was a sandbag carry and it was down like a half pipe. So this is at South Lake Tahoe, um, Squaw Valley Ski Resort <clears throat> in September, late September. So it was snowy, windy weather. Um, and I remember girls were just dropping like flies. It was insane. Like just quitting and falling off the course. And yeah, I was miserable. And yes, I was cold. But at the same time, I just kept telling myself, like, you can't stop. If you stop, one, you're going to hate yourself afterwards. You're going to be so mad at yourself. And two, the only way out of here is to keep going. Like, that's your only option. And then I remember getting down to the half pipe and people were cheering for me that I didn't, I don't even know who they were still. Um, and I just <laughs> I remember <laughs> that some guy said, good job, Ashley, you got this. And I was like, I'm so much tougher than these women. And then I just got like, angry and just charged it up the hill and then I ended up seventh in the world so that worked out great when you're training for these types of things do you put as much pressure on you and I, I know you how much you talk about the importance of recovery and other things but but here's an example like uh, you know I'm uh, I'm on a treadmill this morning uh, at my gym and and it's it's part of uh, like a structured class and they say great we're going to do inclines so set your base pace, which my base pace is like seven and a half miles per hour. Um, and so they're like, great, you start at two. And then the next minute you go up to four and the next minute you go up to six and the next minute you go up to eight. I told myself, it's like, I'm not going to touch that speed until I get to an incline of 10. Um, but as soon as I hit 10, I was like, I, I could have kept going. Like I could have said, I'm not going to touch until I hit incline of 12. I could have picked anything, but I picked 10, I got to 10, then I dropped the speed. And, and that was like my wall, but I'm not sure if I, like I already know that I'm challenging myself more than the other people around me, but I'm not sure if I'm challenging myself as much as I should because my heart rate monitor says things are going crazy. I feel like <laughs> I'm going crazy. I, my legs don't feel good because I just did tons of squats or whatever. In training, when you don't have that, like, I'm going to regret this, do you still hold yourself to these like amped up levels or is that uh, not something that people should do? <laughs> Um, I think there's a time and a place. So like, you know, recovery efforts and stuff. No, 
but in like your your specific dialed in hard workouts which you should really only be doing a few times a week like so when i say recover i mean like i'm going for a 90 minute elliptigo ride and then lift afterwards that would be a recovery day for me okay um <laughs> so your recovery day isn't like um do nothing <laughs> No, definitely not. <laughs> or like, um, go for, just go for like a 5K walk or something. That's like too soft. No, well, I mean, maybe like after a race, but no, <laughs> not usually. <laughs> um, so I mean, like, like my pivotal key workouts where I'm going to, you know, push limits, etc. If I'm by myself, which I do train by myself most of the time, um, I when things get hard, I, I I think about races. Like I think about the girls who I have in my mind that I want to beat. And I imagine that I'm passing them or that I'm racing them. Or I'll say things like, if I want to cut this interval short by five seconds, I'm like, no, 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 this person's not doing that. You have to put in that five seconds if you want to be five seconds better. Like you just, Mm. you have to. Mm. So I try to, and that's why I say there's a time and a place because running on high that much, like all the time is exhausting. (laughs) And you have to give your, like physiologically, there's adaptations that have to be made. So you can't do that all the time. And it's, I don't think it's healthy to do that all the time. I know people who do that all the time and they're injured a lot. Hmm. Um, and not to say that I'm not, cause we keep talking about injuries. We keep but... talking about these cars that, that hit you in. <laughs> yeah. The first one was stupid. On. This last one is not my fault. Okay. <laughs> what about when you rolled your ankle? Oh, that did happen. Yeah, that was terrible. See, I've looked I raced your like history. Two, yeah, I raced like two weeks later. That happens. Ankles are ankles are stupid. <laughs> Ankle, As someone who has a master's degree in physiology, <laughs> I will tell you how stupid ankles really are. Yeah, listen to me. I know what I'm saying. <laughs> ankles are dumb. Um, no, they really are though. That was just kind of a freak thing. I tripped on a rock and it was stupid and it's collateral damage. It happens. Um, it was pretty gnarly though, <laughs> but it was fine. I raced two weeks later. Not great, but I did it. <laughs> yeah. And so, so how much, um, like how forgiving are you then? So you just said like, I raced it, not great, but I did it. If, if you're, if you're having a recovery day or, you know, it's the, um, the fifth day in a row of something, or, you know, you show up to race day and you just know that you're not there. Will you give yourself a, I finished it and that's good enough. Or is that still a huge disappointment to you? Kind of, yeah, both. <laughs> so, for example, after that, when that happened in Utah, and then I went to Colorado two weeks later, I went into, I also had strep throat. Um, I went into that race. It was a survival race. Like, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to put my best effort forward. Was it smart for me to race that? Absolutely not. But the reason I did it is because I was, in second place overall for the mountain series and if i all i had to do was finish to maintain my spot and then that equaled a big check at the end of the season so if the goal wasn't to get that at the end of the season i definitely would not have ran that race i ran that race knowing like i calculated out all the points i had spreadsheets figuring out like where it was at i literally had to finish like 212th to maintain my position which there's not even 200 12 women in the field. So I was like, I literally, all I had to do is You just can't get a DNF then basically. I just can't get a DNF. Yeah, exactly. So that one was not the smartest decision, but it had an ulterior motive. (laughs) Well, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you that. Like, so I wondered before I spoke to you and I don't think that's the case now that I've heard from you, but I wondered if at a certain point you got into this because of passion and then you saw success and whether you continue it for you or you continue it because you feel that everybody's counting on you to be as good as you are. And I, and, and I didn't know if, if that hit home or not, but um, you just, you, you seem to be very successful at what you're doing. Sure. There's other levels. Sure. There's extra things you want to do. Um, yeah. But my goodness, you are like very, very fit. You are very, very <laughs> strong. Uh, you, you do a lot of <laughs> hardcore things and, and you're doing it really well. Are you still doing it? you know, for you, is there still the original, um, the passion, the drive and the why, or at a certain point, do you feel like, like you do it because others are counting on you to be this version of you? If you had asked me that question, uh, six years ago, I would probably have said both. Um, 
but now granted i wasn't doing ocr six years ago but but now uh after some life events that have happened i kind of don't i do but i don't really care what people think <laughs> of me and i think that's one of the most like liberating things that like it was a real shitty thing that happened but um because of that i I am who I am, and if you don't like it, that's your problem, not mine. Like, that sounds really rude, but um, I think that that has made me more satisfied with the choices that I make. And I mean, obviously, like, you know, my husband is part of those decisions, and sometimes we do butt heads because I do say things like that, and he's like, wait a minute, I'm part of this equation too, and I'm like, oh yeah, right, we're married, forgot. Um, <laughs> so I guess I do have to consider that. <laughs> But I mean, I, I think that because of stuff, because of life experience, I have learned that the things that I do, I need to do for me because regardless of what everyone else thinks, they're more intrinsically motivated anyways. Like, like I try to tell my mom this all the time because she's, she's very concerned about how her clothes look and stuff. And I just, I'm not the person that really cares that much about that kind of stuff. I mean, I don't want to look like a bum, but I, like, I try to tell her that everyone else around you is so worried about themselves. They don't even see what you're doing or wearing. So, and I understand like, that's a little bit different for myself where I do have people that are watching me, but I think that being able to be myself and being authentically me is more liberating to other people than putting on a facade of something I'm not. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. A hundred percent. A lot of words. No, no, no. That that does. I, it, I think I think most people realize it and understand it. And you know, I would be the first to give people that advice. I don't know if I live it. I don't know if I don't know if people live it as well as as they can say it. And so, if if you've gotten to the point where you pick the things that you want to do, you say the things that you want to say you say no to the things that you don't want to do without feeling guilty or shame or whatever else. If, you, if you've been able to do that more often than not, then I'd say that that's a really awesome thing. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I don't want to sound like a jerk, but at the same time, like I, it's just, you feel so much happier with yourself when you take away again, the, the, like social stigma that everybody, you have to do everything to please everybody else. And sometimes maybe people deem that selfish. And I've had that conversation with people a lot, um, particularly my mom. Um, and she always says, I wish I could be like that. How did you become that way? And I'm like, well, one life events, but I also just realized like everybody else is so self centered that they don't actually care. <laughs> Nobody cares that I have a broken leg right now. Nobody cares except me and my husband, because I know I am every day asking if he thinks I'm able to run next week, you know, um, <laughs> People will be empathetic, but they honestly don't care because they care about what their next run or workout's going to be. You know what I mean? Like yeah. on a deeper level, only the people really close to me are the ones that actually are bugged by it. <laughs> Would, so, so knowing what you know and, and, and kind of doing the successes you've done, do you believe that um, if someone were looking at you, if, if my daughter, my, Rachel, you know, she's, she's 14 and she's looking at you online and saying, wow, that's, that's a bad woman who's doing things that, I could never do that. Could, can, can people, maybe not executing at the level you do, but can people do what you do? Yeah. And, and, and what do you say to people who think that, because you've, you've now hit superhuman category, right? Like people don't see you as, people who are introduced to you through your sport do not see you as a normal person. They see you as someone who was born with these most amazing skills and they must just come naturally to you. No, you gotta work for that. Um, I remember when I was little sitting on my dad's knee and he always has instilled in me that like you can do anything if you want it bad enough and heart goes farther than skill. Like in high school, if we were playing some like a basketball game, cause I played basketball in high school, he'd say like, you might not be the better team, but whoever wants it more is going to win. And I, I think I, I still think that to this day that like, if I believe it, if I want it more, if I put in more work, if I, if my desire is greater, then I'm going to be successful. So I don't, I think that anybody can be anything that they want. 
and it should they should absolutely not give up on it until they achieve that. I, that's I just don't like. I would tell your fourteen year old daughter if you think you want to be the president, then go for it. Do it. Do everything in your power to make that happen if that's your dream. Absolutely, whatever it takes, do it. I love it. I will so, tell you, we live in Canada, so unfortunately, we can't become the president. You don't want to be the president. <laughs> we can't. It's against the law. <laughs> Prime minister, whatever. There you go, Prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, My yeah, bad. and. Um, so what I found is, you know, I think obsession and excitement will carry people really, really far. Like it's just the, it's just the wind that, you know, it's like, it's like having the wind at your back, right? Like it's just going to take you so much further. And then the valley comes, you know, like, like the realization, like, oh, this isn't going to be as fast as I thought. This is a lot harder than I thought. Um, this is way more boring than I thought. Um, no one's <laughs> watching anymore. You know, like people used to pat me on the back for how awesome I was doing and everybody's bored of talking to me about this thing, right? Like that valley kind of sets in. How do you, through your training or through the people you've worked with or through even just, you know, race after race after race, at a certain point, you're like, I've done these races. How do you push through that valley that I think everybody faces at a certain time? I think that's where a lot of the discipline comes in. Like, I just have to remember what's on the other side of it because you know, you've seen that meme of like the iceberg and it shows success and then underneath it shows all of the other crap that you go through. That's, that's real. Right. Um, and social media is awful at portraying just the, the highlights. Um, and sometimes there's stuff I want to post on social media to tell people like, yeah, I'm human too. There's crappy things happening in my life right now too. Not just but like, you know, there's lots of stuff, all the fires in Oregon right now. My, I have extended family that have lost their homes. They're out. Like they are just placed, like there's just really things, right? And we all have that. Um, I just don't always portray all of that. And I think I, you know, um, so it would be ignorant to think that everybody isn't still human. Um, oh, I forgot where I was going with that. What was the question again? <laughs> how do you get through the, how do you get through the valley? Oh, yeah. When right. the excitement well, is gone, yeah. when, when you're in the dark, right? So you just have to know that, that there's, there's light on the other side. Like this is part of the experience. Hmm. That's another thing my dad used to always say to me. Dad, I guess I talk about him a lot. He's kind of like my hero. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> there's, and oh, that's another thing he always said, be humble. But you just have to remember this is part of the experience. It's all part of the experience, dear. That's literally what he would say to me. Um, like there's, it, nothing is ever going to be perfect. I don't believe in perfection there's just a constant strive to be better and knowing that there's going to be speed bumps and it is going to be challenging. That's, that's the draw. Like you have to be invested in the journey in order for the result to come. If you just focus on the result, you'll never get there. Hmm. That's great advice. If that makes sense. So like, and I think a lot of it for me is discipline. I learned that at a young age, I ski raced for a long time. I ski raced for Mount bachelor ski education foundation did a lot of sports when I was a kid. You're, yeah, you're like super sporty. <laughs> like, oh goodness, you're like, like, yeah, you know, I used to do this and do this and I do this. Yeah. Yeah, I graduated high school with like, with like 20 varsity letters, which is something just stupid, but I went to a small school, but it's burned now. That whole area is burned. So that's fun. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, yeah, I ski raced. So I, I was on like the junior Olympic development team or however you want to say that for the U.S. ski team. Like I have friends that I raced with then that are on the U.S. ski team now, which doesn't mean as much. Well, one of them was, she's actually part Canadian. Anyway, <laughs> um, so we would go on these races for long periods of time, like with everything else that I did and then racing on the weekends. And we lived like an hour and a half away from the ski resort, um, maybe two hours. It was just like, if I wanted to do it, I knew I had to put in the work. And so these valleys are part of putting in the work. Like no athlete has never been injured. If they've never had an injury, then they're not truly an athlete or they're not doing anything to be better. I would just wouldn't believe you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Even if it's an ankle sprain or something like that. So I think that you just have to remember that through that discipline, even when it gets hard, that's part of the journey to get there. Again, that was it. a lot of words. I love it. Uh, I have two more questions. The first is, what what do you believe the hardest thing is you've ever had to push through? 
So I believe that emotional pain is much less easy to endure than physical pain. Um, so I would say, oh, prob probably <laughs> the first time I got like a serious injury, that was pretty terrible. I missed, that was in college. Um, and I missed some really big events. I missed nationals. I missed big things that I thought would end my career. Um, yeah, I would just say like sometimes the emotional turmoil and then believing in myself after that happened. So that confidence thing and it not just being a facade, but actually like fixing that and changing. And it's still a work in progress. I would not say I'm perfect by any means. I don't also believe in perfect. Um, which I already said, <laughs> I don't believe in perfection. I love your little um, side notes. You have like side notes on side notes. It's so great. All right. Yeah, I do that. I give them told I go on lots of tangents. No, I like it. <laughs> There's a lot of squirrels up here. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I think just that like believing in myself after something awful has happened, I guess, but and, doing it anyway. Um, I said there was two more questions and now I have a follow up for that. Was, was, <laughs> was how, how did you get through that? How do you well, do that? You just a lot of phone calls there. to my dad. Okay. <laughs> the first time, um, a lot of crying. There was lots of because, tears because it feels like, like I can just imagine, it feels like you have worked for opportunity, and you're just letting it slip by, and and that's your shot. You got one shot. The shot you're missing the shot, and and there's nothing you've been, you know. I I've had that experience in my life. I think we all have right just like right. working for something and then finding you get there and then and you don't even get an at bat you don't even like yeah yeah i'd say well not allowing yourself to feel like the victim and understanding that sometimes bad shit just happens um like the car accident so again i told my mom this she so I was riding my bike and I got hit by a car. I got hit by a Suburban uh, from behind. It was a hit and run. It was a terrible experience. I'm still recovering from it. Uh, this happened a couple months ago. But <clears throat> I remember when I was talking to her, she got upset, of course. I, she should have been. Um, and she just kept saying, like, why you? You work so hard for everything. Like, why did it have to be you? Why couldn't it have been someone else? And I kind of surprised myself when I told her, like, here I am consoling her, I was like, you know, I don't, I'm not looking at it that way. Like I'm looking at it as maybe someone else wouldn't have been able to endure this. And so it was for me to take this hit for them. Or one of my friends suggested that maybe it was me being part of someone else's life lesson. And I was kind of collateral damage, but I'm going to come back from it and be fine so rather than playing the victim and having that victim mentality, just knowing that and trusting that I can get through it and I'm going to be better because of it. That sounds cliche, but that's the way you have to believe it. So. I, I think that's super powerful. I don't think that's cliche at all. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I really respect that point of view. Uh, oh, I, I think I would, you know, I say a lot of things where, I like, I, I try not to say things unless if, so like, so I, I developed, I, I always felt anxiety and loss over things. And I really struggle at the end of summer. The summer feels special and magical to me, you know, mm -hmm. and kids going back to school and not going, you know, to the lake or all of this stuff feels like the loss of something. And so right. last year I told myself there, there is no loss. There's only opportunity. There is no loss. There's only opportunity. No matter what, you know, you, you, you lose a client, you lose a business, you lose a friend. Um, you lose your house, you go bankrupt. There's no loss. It's, it just opens up, you know, hard times lead to lessons. It just opens up nothing. Else. And then my wife goes, yeah, but what if one of our kids was killed? And I go like, okay, would I be willing to say there is no loss? There's only opportunity. What, you know, what would the opportunity be? And, you know, the woman who started, you know, Mothers Against Drug Drivers lost a child mm -hmm. um, in a terrible situation and it led to something. So big picture, I know it'll lead to something, but I struggle to say things you know, right. when, when things really get hard. And so then I really, I really respect your answer. It's not cliche at all because um, you're, you're willing to say it while you're dealing with something that's really hard. 
right. you're not saying it just on Instagram to be like hot <laughs> fluffy. And so I do really respect that. I think, I think there's a great lesson there. Yeah, maybe I should make a post about that because I don't think I really have. <laughs> <laughs> Put it on Instagram, make it all positive and inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> write that down. <laughs> yeah, you can listen back and transcribe what you said because it was brilliant. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't even remember what I said now. <laughs> so, like, uh, exactly. the, the last question I have for you is, 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 you know, obviously you're leveling up and leveling up and leveling up. So what's next, right? Like, you know, um, things can get harder to a certain point, but you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, like what's, what's next for you to keep getting tougher and to keep going? Well, apparently I'm going to start racing dirt bikes. I don't yeah, know what that says. You're going to be an MX <laughs> rider who does freestyle tricks for the, yeah. uh, for the winter or for summer X games. Can't imagine how many broken bones that's going to make happen, but. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you like flying into cheese pits because it's going to happen a lot. <laughs> Yeah. No, you. Um, okay. Uh, I guess, well, I have some pretty lofty goals mm -hmm. um, for this. Well, it was supposed to be this year, but then, you know, it hit the fan. Um, so I guess we're going to put that off till next year. Uh, I think I'm, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep going. I want to, you know, kind of bridge the gap between me and some of the women in my field and I know that I can make that happen. So there's that, that's real confidence right there. Um, and I just have to zero in on the things that I have to improve on to, to do that. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going until I can't. Yeah, that's kind of a very broad answer. answer, but I'm just- <laughs> No, cause you said keep so Keep going much. until I can't go anymore. Said, I'm gonna target in and fix the things that I need to fix to get better. So even in that answer you're demonstrating to me, like, okay, I got to talk more like this. I got to think more like this, you know, I'm going <laughs> to become a tough dude because right now, yeah. uh, you know, I'm like an upper middle class white guy in a, in a free country, <laughs> um, raised in a pretty safe city where it's like, I, I don't feel like I've had as much diversity as everyone else. So, so now yeah, I'm and it's all life. relative though. Yeah. That's not fair. Some, it just depends, you know, on the person comes where you're at. No. Yeah. And I also don't think like being tough, like, yeah, you want to be tough. Like we, we make that sound all regal and stoic, but I think it's a perception more. So like, I think it's a matter of you believing you can do whatever that thing is rather than it actually being toughness. I would call it confidence instead. Remember pushing the limit equals confidence. Wasn't that a compelling interview? I mean, wasn't that story amazing? I mean, Ashley's lessons and, and the, the story that she shares really reminds me how important self-confidence is. And you may not realize it because you're hearing me or you're watching me, or maybe you see what I do, but you may not realize it. But this is something that I struggle with every single day. I do not have the confidence that I wish I had. And so for me coming out of this, key takeaways, number one, if you push to your limits, you will gain confidence. Number two, it doesn't matter what someone says to you. If they say that you can't, it doesn't matter as long as you think that you can. And number three, you have to be invested in the journey if you want to see the results. Now, living in fear, uh, listening to the haters, listening to that voice of doubt in your head, it will keep you standing still. And standing still is death. Shifting gears a little bit, I want to remind you, go to Apple Podcasts. Please rate and review this. It would mean the world to me. If you're not subscribed, please do subscribe. And as long as I'm begging... If you want to connect with me, you can reach out to me on IG. You can drop me a DM. Remember, those of us who have something to prove, we can show the world, we can show ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen. But you have to think big. You've got to be bold and you must say yes.